Every time I go on, I find grace on repeat. You welcome me with open arms, no matter where I have been. Every time I surrender, every time I fall, I find grace more precious than I did before. So I'm gonna lay my world down here at your feet. Look to the Sing my heart out, praise on repeat to the God who's never given up on me. You're the mercy of men, you're the kindness of God. My hope in every waking hour and the strength of the young. Every time it comes to sundown and the night sets in. That my soul remember just how good you been And again and again my heart will sing I'm gonna leave my world here at your feet Look to the hell for all I need I'm gonna sing Shines for all 
to see From the ashes of defeat The resurrected King is resurrecting me In your name I come alive To declare your victory The resurrected King is resurrecting me By your Spirit I will rise From the ashes of defeat The resurrected King is resurrecting me
Good morning and welcome to the river. My name is Dean Ward and I'm the lead pastor of the river and I'm so grateful that you have chosen to join in with us this morning. Perhaps there's a friend or family member that you would like to share this with. I'd love to invite you to take a moment and share this with them so they can join in with us today. I don't know if you've noticed or not, but there's a movement going on in our country today. Uh, it's a radical movement. It's a movement that we've not seen or experienced. It's a movement that's kind of new over the past little bit, and that is simply called the Tiny House Movement. Now, I don't know if you've ever seen any of the TV shows that show how you can build a tiny house or how you can spend lots of money and have a tiny house built just for you, how you can take all the equity, sell your house and take all the equity and buy a tiny house for the exact same price. So I don't know if you've seen any of those shows, but when they come on, my wife and I watch them for a little bit and we start to imagine, we start to wonder, could we live in a tiny house? What would that be like to just live our entire lives in a tiny house? It's a very short conversation because I think both of us realize tiny houses aren't for us. However, if they were, sometimes I find it helpful to experience the reality of something before you jump in it with both feet. And so today I'm behind the church and we have the beginnings of a tiny house. So I wanted to just kind of enjoy some time sitting outside of my potential tiny house. And uh, I wanna invite you to come experience the vastness of my tiny house. Now, this tiny house uh, has enough room for this bench. <laughs> now you may wonder, why would I ever consider a tiny house in a shed behind the church. Well, it would cut down on gas driving to church and back. Uh, but even more than that, I have so many amenities right here. I have the dumpster. We can take out all of our garbage without much effort. Uh, I have a water line right outside uh, against, the door, against the church building here. And I can run an extension cord from the basement to the tiny house so my electric bills would be uh, totally eliminated. So I know I'm being silly. <laughs> Well, we're here today because we're looking at Paul and his conversation he had with the Athenians. And in this conversation, he was letting them know the biggest risk they were experiencing in life was not the notion of living in tiny houses, but the notion of living tiny lives. And my fear for us is that we might settle and live tiny lives and not even know it. Paul was having this fascinating conversation with some of the brightest minds in all of Athens, people who had given their lives to study philosophy and politics, people who were very learned. And he's introducing them to the notion that their city, their city of Athens should be rebranded. You know how Los Angeles is known as the city of angels? Well, their city, the city of Athens, could be known as the city of idols. Uh, they had some 30,000 idols that they worshiped that were part of their religious system. They were religious people, but they didn't know the one true God. And so Paul was very committed to helping them see and learn and understand who this one true God is. So we are in part four of our series, Welcome to Athens, this ancient message for our current lives. And today's message is just simply called, beyond the small. Paul wanted them to move beyond the smallness with which they were navigating life and beyond the smallness of the idols that they worshiped. 
Paul continues his conversation with them in Acts chapter 17, verse 29. He says, therefore, since we are God's offspring, we should not think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image made by human design and skill. Uh, Paul is saying, you have minimized God to something of your own creation. You have limited God to an image that you have designed, that you have created. It's like Paul is saying to them, just how big is your God? This is a question that's been posed from the beginning of time. We see the evil one tempting Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden in this dialogue he's having with Eve. And he said, well, what did God tell you about this tree, about this fruit? And she said, well, God told me this. And the evil one said, well, no, no, no. God didn't really tell you this. He, he told you this for this reason because he's afraid that you will become like him if you partake of this fruit. And then Eve, she decided, she decided in her desire to live a vast, enormous, big life, she decided to trade it all in and live a very small life. A life that by this choice was much smaller and much less than what God had ever planned for them to live. And Paul is drawing to their attention and basically asking them, how big is your God? Adam and Eve swapped this expansive God for a God of their own understanding. And this is exactly what the Athenians were doing. Therefore, in light of the fact that God is spirit, so big, the creator, how can you stick him into an image? It's like you are limiting God and therefore limiting you. If you shrink God, you shrink yourself. If you shrink God to an inanimate object that you have made, and worship and dedicate your whole life to that, you are limiting your life. You are living a tiny life. I love the way that God in Isaiah reminds us of how vast and big and awesome he is. He says in chapter 45, verses five through seven, I am the Lord, and there is no other. Apart from me, there is no God. I will strengthen you, though you have not acknowledged me. So that from the rising of the sun to the place of its setting, people may know there is none beside me. I am the Lord, and there is no other. I form the light and create darkness. I bring prosperity and create disaster. I, the Lord, do all these things. All the gods they had created had lim the limitation of human imagination, human skill, and human limitations. The one true God is so much more than I could ever come up with. And Jesus is so much more than we would ever create. You know, Garth Brooks sang a song the other week at the inauguration, and it's the one religious song that is accepted all across our country. It's the one religious song that people of different religions and different uh, ideolo I, you know what I'm saying, <laughs> of different values. It's the one song, the one religious song that we sing together. And it's that song, Amazing Grace. 
I love that song, and I loved Garth Brooks' performance of that song. And this song resonates with so many because it is beyond our comprehension. This amazing grace is beyond what I can imagine. It's beyond, way beyond our skill. God's amazing grace is beyond our design. It's something other. It's beyond human. And we are drawn to it like moths to a campfire. We are drawn to this amazing grace. And you can listen to it and be um, moved by this song. Because it's so important. There has to be movement in our life. As this song moves us, we are invited to move from the, just the general realization of there being a God to God's amazing grace that is embodied in Christ Jesus, our Lord. When Paul gets to this point of his conversation with the Athenians, he's letting them know there's so much more than your tiny life with these idols. And I'm letting us know that there's so much more than the tiny ideas and notions that many of us have dedicated our life to. The bigger, the bigger, the more, all those things that we think will fulfill us can actually make our lives quite tiny. It's not a bait and switch that Paul did. It's, it's a bait and show. He talked about this general revelation of God, this vast God that created everything, and now he's calling them down to show them who he is, and what they need to do. In verse 30, Paul says, In the past, God overlooked such ignorance. In the past, you know, God has overlooked your, all of your idolatry. God has overlooked all of that. But now, Paul says, he commands all people everywhere to repent. So, so what does that look like? T to repent. Uh, what does that look like to surrender the tiny life for the life that God calls us to? Let's enjoy this video together. For too long, I've wandered For too long, I've roamed I've looked for fulfillment but found no home My heart, my soul grieving I've struggled with believing Buying into all of this deceiving And the lies keep pouring in They told me I'd be okay if I made enough money at the end of the day If I got that promotion If I got that new car If I got that house with that dog in the yard I'd be fine But they lied Cause somewhere inside I'm empty I need more than what I have And I'm not even looking for material things I've had enough of that I need something deeper something real or something that's more than what I'm feeling because right now I'm lost honestly I mean I've heard that Jesus died for me but what does that even mean doesn't everybody die what makes this man so special what makes him what I need what makes his blood more powerful when he bleeds I want to know I want to understand so I'm here on this day to find out I mean, is it true? Did he really raise from the grave? Did he really heal the blind and the lame? Did he really make the world? Did he really calm the seas? If this is true, then he is what I need. 
So on this day, I choose to believe. Not in a fairy tale, not in a lie, but in hope. In hope that he really did rise. In faith that he is who he says he is. In faith that he rose. In faith he ascended and is preparing us a home. If all this is true, then I want to know him. My mother-in-law used to be amused whenever preachers used to call for repentance and they would make this little joke. They'd say, don't swear or chew or date girls that do. And (laughs) it was always this notion of, I got to stop swearing, I got to stop smoking, I got to stop chewing, I got to... And we have made repentance a little... And so I want us to have a more expansive understanding of what repentance is, of what Paul is calling the Athenians to repent from and turn to, what Paul is calling them to experience, and what Jesus is calling us to. If we are called to repent, that requires something from us. It's not just enough to know about God. It's not just enough to believe that there's a God. Paul is inviting the Athenians to turn from their ignorance about the belief that God is all of these little things. Paul calls them to repent, to turn from their small stories to turn from their small ideas. They didn't think they had small ideas, but in fact they did. He's calling them to repent, to turn to a better story, to turn to the bigness and vastness of God, to turn to an expansive, wide open view and experience with God. I'm filming somewhere that I've never been before. I've only seen photographs of it. And I've always wanted to come here. And so I figured, what better day than the last Sunday in January, the last weekend in January? What better time to see this view? But just behind me is this expansive, amazing, spectacular view of New Kensington, the city that I live in, the city that I'm called to, the city that I'm passionate about, the city and community that I am giving my life to. And contrasted to the small, tiny existence I would have in that silly little shed out back, I love this view because it reminds me of the bigness of what God has called me to, not just in my calling, but in my life. I love the way Paul describes this and the way that Eugene Peterson, in his paraphrase, called the message the way he describes 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 11 through 13, this call to this wide open, expansive experience of repentance and turning from the small lives that we have dedicated ourselves to, to the big God and the big life that he has called us to. Eugene Peterson says it this way, 2 Corinthians 6, 11 through 13. Dear Christians, I can't tell you how much I long for you to enter this wide open, spacious life. We didn't fence you in. The smallness you feel comes from within you. Your lives aren't small but you're living them in a small way. I'm speaking as plainly as I can and with great affection. Open up your lives. Live openly 
and expansively. And I want to invite you to shift your view of repentance from eliminating and only having, you know, just, I have to get rid of all of this stuff. I want to invite you to expand your understanding of repentance to an expansive life, embracing God, enveloping all that he has called you to become, living the life that he has invited you to live, this expansive, wide open life, forgiven, filled with grace, filled with joy, filled with peace, filled with life. I'm wearing my favorite orange boots because these boots make me feel ready for whatever adventure God has for me, whatever he has ahead for me. And I hope that you live your life ready for all that God has for you. I pray that you will repent and turn from the littleness that so many of us have settled for in our lives and that we will commit to this expansive, wide open life with Jesus Christ. Now, Paul in verse 31 wraps this all up and I'm just gonna read it and then we're gonna hit this next week. In verse 31, Paul talking about God says, for he has set a day when he will judge the world with justice by the man he has appointed. He has given proof to this. He has given proof of this to everyone by raising him from the dead. Jesus is talking, Paul is talking about Jesus here and this expansive life that can be found only in him. Amen.